When I was a boy growing up in New York City, um, thanks to my father, I went frequently to the parks and also to the largest zoo in the United States, and I became fascinated with animals, both in the zoo and in the wild. I became very interested in birds, I became interested in reptiles and insects, and as this interest grew, I wanted to learn to become a biologist, and as I started to learn about biology, I understood that the the reason that we have such magnificent diversity of animals and plants and other living things is through an evolutionary process. And because I was fascinated by the great wonderful diversity of living things, I decided that I needed to know more about how they came into existence, and that led me into becoming an evolutionary biologist. I realized that there were no textbooks on the subject. It was possible to ask students to write, to read some books, but they did not provide a complete introduction to the subject. And so when a, a, a young publisher uh, knocked on my door and we talked about the possibility of writing such a book, um, I thought it would be very easy. And of course it turned out to be much more complicated, but it led to a, my writing a book which was fairly successful because it had no competition, so it was very easy. <laughs> Unfortunately, it is still the case, despite education, that in the United States, about half of the population does not accept evolution of the humans or evolution in general. And the opposition to evolution uh, in the form of creationism, or what is now called intelligent design, which is the same thing, this opposition remains extremely strong coming from, mostly from fundamentalist religious groups. They have tried many times to have a creationist alternative to evolution taught in science courses in high schools. In the United States this is illegal because our constitution forbids the government to support any kind of religion. But more importantly, it must be understood that an explanation by some kind of supernatural being is not a scientific explanation. When we teach science, we must restrict ourselves to ideas, hypotheses, in which it is possible to obtain evidence. In other words, it is possible to test hypotheses. But we cannot gain any evidence about the characteristics or the operations of some supernatural being by definition. And so that means that in order for science to remain science, any kind of non-scientific explanations, explanations which cannot be tested by the methods of science, must be ruled out. And we must restrict ourselves in teaching science to teaching only scientific explanations. But I want to make a very, very important point. This does not mean that any scientist should deny religion or deny the existence of God or deny religious belief. It is very important to understand that science can say nothing about anything supernatural, either in favor or against. It must remain completely separated. And so it's very important to understand that there is no conflict necessarily between religious belief and science, in particular evolution, but rather they must remain separated from each other. Last April, I was very fortunate to be invited to a symposium in the Vatican University in Rome, which was a symposium about evolution and religion, called in the university, which is uh, the, Je the Jesuit University. It must be understood that at this meeting, which was about the relation between evolution and theology, no member of the church 
spoke against evolution. The Roman Catholic Church, like many other of the older churches, accepts science, accepts evolution. In fact, the previous pope wrote an explicit statement, an explicit letter, in which he said that now there is so much evidence for evolution that it must be taken as more than just a hypothesis, he said, but rather as a scientific fact. So it's very important for people to understand that many religions, including the Catholic Church, accept evolution as a scientific fact. Yeah, this is a this at first was a difficult problem for Darwin and he he came close to the answer which was then developed uh, in especially the 1960s um, and one part of that answer is uh, based on the fact that we now understand genetics we understand that characteristics including behavioral characteristics are inherited in the form of genes these genes are passed on to our offspring, but also they are many of the same genes are shared between myself and my sister and my brother and my other relatives. And therefore, it is possible that by helping a related individual, the, I would enable the genes for that altruistic behavior, which are also carried by my, re, by my sister, my brother, my cousin, I would help those genes to survive and become propagated. And so characteristics which are um, altruistic, even if they are harmful for the individual that performs the behavior, they may be inherited and propagated by closely related individuals um, who carry the same genes for that behavior. More recently, there have been other hypotheses as well, with some evidence from experiments. For example, something called reciprocation in which um, individuals that are capable of forming alliances who recognize one another and who form a social alliance may enable each other to profit by directing their behavior specifically at the individual who in turn will help them in the future. And this is common, it seems to be common, in, uh, in intelligent animals such as many mammals and many primates in particular. Um, it is actually remarkable that um, the study of speciation, the formation of two species from one common ancestral species, the study of speciation in the last century, which became very active in the 1940s and has become active, very active since then, during that period, until very recently, we actually had very little evidence about the extent to which natural selection is the cause of speciation. I think this was one of the most neglected questions in the study of evolution. Perhaps because everyone assumed that we already knew that the answer was yes. Um, but we did not actually know that answer because it was necessary to show that the ecological differences between species which are the result of natural selection also somehow it cause reproductive isolation, which is to say, cause the species not to interbreed with one, with one another, if we accept that as the definition of species. Species are populations that don't interbreed with each other. It is only in about the last 15 years that we have begun to obtain such evidence, and I think it is now becoming quite clear that speciation is indeed the consequence of different populations of an ancestral species becoming adapted to different environments or to feeding on different foods um, as a consequence of different natural selection forces on their different populations. And that these changes result in a genetic incompatibility or sometimes a behavioral incompatibility between the populations so that they will no longer mate with one another or cannot produce offspring. But an important 
component of this also is the form of natural selection that Darwin called sexual selection, which was the subject of his second great book, The Descent of Man. Sexual selection is one is the con involves the concept that female animals prefer males that have certain characteristics, which sometimes are very elaborate ornaments and behaviors. And it, there is some evidence that, di that different sexual selection, different preferences may arise in the females of different populations of one ancestral species, and that as these preferences become more different from one another, the two populations will become unlikely to, in, to mate with one another because the females of one population refuse to accept the, fe the males of the other population. I, all of biology has undergone a revolutionary change um, since the 1960s, since, uh, well, since the 1950s when DNA was found to be the genetic material. Um, the molecular biological revolution has influenced absolutely every corner of biology, and that is perhaps especially true of the study of evolution. Um, and I will give you just a, several instances. Um, number one, we now can study genes. Remember that evolution is a process of genetic change in the characteristics of organisms. And we are now capable of actually studying the genes that constitute the variation on which natural sele selection can act. And so the entire genetic study of evolution has been transformed. Now we are moving into an era of genomics in which we now can identify, can get the sequence of DNA of the entire genetic complement of a species and compare it with other species. The ability to compare the genes at the DNA level throughout the entire genome enables us to specify, for example, what are the differences between a human and a chimpanzee? Um, what are the differences among different closely related species of Drosophila fruit flies, the subject of a great deal of genetic research? And these comparisons are helping us to understand all the kinds of genetic changes that have gone into the evolutionary process and the divergence of different species. Finally, understanding how different species are related to one another, the phylogenetic tree of life, um, in which we find that humans are more closely related to chimpanzees and then to other kinds of primates and have a more distant relationship to other kinds of mammals. This kind of piecing together all the relationships among living things is something which is now possible using DNA in a way that was never possible before because the, the DNA provides so much, um, so much data, so much information. And a very important aspect of that is that these phylogenetic studies uh, using DNA have corroborated many of the relationships that traditional taxonomists imagined on the basis of anatomy. And so this is an important aspect, one of the many, many uh, cases we have in which there are independent lines of evidence in favor of the same evolutionary hypothesis. And this, of course, strengthens the confidence that we have in our entire hypothesis of the, evolu of the history of evolution and the evolutionary process. It's a very large question, and I will make it even larger by asking what are the ways in which evolutionary knowledge and, uh, and evolutionary science are useful and important. And I want to emphasize that basic research on evolution, just like basic research in any other area of science, is necessary in order to develop useful applications. Um, for example, there are many areas of medicine, of understanding human health and disease, in which evolutionary science is extremely important, ranging from the study of um, uh, pathogens such as, as disease bacteria, uh, the malarial organism, the mosquitoes that carry malaria, ranging from that to 
uh, understanding genes which cause diseases when they are mutated. So we have inherited diseases. And evolution has a great deal to say about that. It also plays a large role in controlling uh, pests, uh, insect pests of crops, and has other uh, agricultural applications. In the realm of anthropology, sociology, psychology, there of course is a very long history of um, thinking about the role of evolution. And this to some extent can be more conceptual and philosophical. Um, um, from the very beginning it was understood that evolution was a process of change and that we could think, for example, about cultural evolution of human, of human societies as processes of change. They are not necessarily biological evolution, but some of the same kinds of processes may, be, may go on in an analogy between biological evolutionary processes and cultural evolutionary processes. And this, is, this remains an area of active research. Um, it is also the case that many people are concerned with the, or are interested in the degree to which we humans have inherited characteristics of our behavior, characteristics of our mind, characteristics of our emotions, which may influence the way in which, be, in which we behave. This is a very controversial area because obviously our behavior, our thinking, our emotions are also greatly conditioned by learning by our experience of other individuals, our experience of what our parents have taught us, and of what society has taught us. So there is clearly an interaction between our genetic inheritance from the evolutionary past and the impact of our society, of our experience, during the course of our own personal development. I think most people have come to agree that there is some important component of the evolutionary genetic ancestry that affects our behavior. But it's also, of course, extremely important to realize that that is always subject to some modification by our experience, by our environment, by, by the factors that sociologists study. I do not think that there must be a conflict between biology, including evolution, on the one hand, and sociological or psychological science on the other hand. I think that there must be some way of combining these because clearly they are both important. But exactly how to understand the contributions of both of those remains a very difficult problem.